folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And a guy who I've been tracking for some time. It, actually, I never really thought I'd ever get to him. Um, master rhythmist who has played, has found a lot of success, frankly, uh, across the pond in Europe and made a name for himself playing with so many luminary musicians. But I think all those luminary cats would be the first to tell you that a lot of their tracks on records and a lot of their live performances wouldn't mean a whole lot without. Jerry Brown, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Uh very uh, happy and honored to be here. It is an honor to connect How with you. How are you doing today? I'm having a ball, man. That, I mean, uh, absolutely, positively. Posit, uh, that was what we came in with. And yeah, it's like uh, I was wondering what the hell what, that sounded familiar. And, and uh, it's like, oh, if that was me, it's like, oh God. I, you know, I, this is my first question. I, I really just want you to talk about the Jerry Brown concept. I'm, I'm very fascinated with the concept of any note can be the one. And I, and I, I, I feel the music that you were, that you grew up with, that you played with even before you got into a professional career. Um, I, I just want you to talk about your concept of any note can be the one. Uh, boy, any note that, that, that can be the one, well, I, I would say, uh, that concept comes from the, uh, uh, a bit of the, from what I noticed of, uh, when I listened to, and still just recently, uh, seeing the video clip, uh, with Elvin Jones, and that was, when he came when with his playing wherever the quote unquote one was everybody knew it <laughs> and it was so it was like uh, you know it's like putting your foot down like, here's the one so uh, yeah you know uh yeah that any note can be the one is y- yes that's true but when you put that emphasis on where that one should be, and hopefully everybody's on that same groove because you're, you know, um, that point of reference has to be, everyone has to be on the same page. So you're taking that responsibility of like, here's the, where the one is. So um, that's where that concept comes from. And, you know, quite uh naturally that uh drummer we're that that focal point of uh, of uh where that one is so hopefully uh, everyone's on the same page and that uh you're you know you're grooving and uh, your time is is really really beyond good but uh, almost impeccable and uh, even if they, even if it kind of sways a little bit, as you know, from the days of when when the drummers were not playing to uh, click tracks and things like that, and hearing some of the you know from from swing to to R and B and stuff, those those wonderful days in the sixties and seventies. You know the drum. You know the drummer is the hot. You know it's kind of like the hot seat. So you have that responsibility of uh, uh, leading the band and or singer, or whatever. It's like you know you have control of that. So well, I want to talk. Um, I want to talk to you about this. You talk about everybody being on the same page, and I want yes. you to go back. Did you you grew up in Philadelphia? Yes, I did. Um, yeah, with some yeah, with some marginal bass player, some guy named Stanley Clark. Yeah, no, my man Stanley. I want to talk to you about. <laughs> I, I mean, my, I mean, this is so cathartic for me, man, because I love. I mean, can you just talk about 
the band that you were in early on in the 60s when you when everybody got on the same is it just about experience on the bandstand is it about i mean because being on the same page that's exactly right everybody has to come back in on the one if you lose the one so what was the first exactly what was the first gig you had that where everybody got on the same page was it with stan clark it was well it was with stanley and and uh, the uh, the story is <laughs> in Phil in, 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 in Philadelphia. Uh, I mean, I met Stanley. Uh, we were about twelve years old, and uh, this was at a time where school systems uh, had music. All city music groups in in elementary school, in junior high school, and in, and in senior high school. So. Uh, I met Stanley when we were twelve, and you know, uh, he he had just made this this transition from uh, playing. He originally started out as a cellist, and then uh, he went to bass. And we we eventually talked, and we found found out that we were listening a lot to the same to the same music. You know, he was listening to, to Charlie Mingus and Scott Lafaro. Oh, I love it. I and, love and, you know, this dude. And, oh my and, god! And, 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 you know. Coltrane and, and Elvin and stuff, and then we were also listening to like the R and B that was that was being played, like you know, like the Temptations and James Brown. And what was really what was really important was like listening to like the James Brown and, and the and the R and B of those days. Was that there were dances that were going on in the high you know, high schools and stuff and. Uh, there were some band leaders in Philadelphia that that would put bands together to, to perform for these dances. So it was like for me, it was so important to know those those James Brown grooves and to know those you know those you know, songs from Temptations and and Smokey Robinson and Four Tops. Uh, you were starting to get it. A little more into uh, uh, there, there was like the spinners. So it's like all these 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 songs you had to know you had to know these grooves because that pertains to playing these gigs. And if you didn't know those grooves, you're not going to be playing on those gigs. Also, in those bands, was, uh, there was another great musician who was older than Stanley and myself, but he was also playing in those bands from Philadelphia, and that was the great saxophonist, uh, rest in peace in Groove in Paradise, Mr. Groover Washington Jr. Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah. He, oh, he rest in peace, Grover, man. Dude, Earth Tones. So you're telling me that this band, Grover, wait, and, and was Stanley Rock of the Upright, or was he playing electric? No, he was playing, he was playing electric then he was you know he, he was getting into the to the electric thing and stuff besides you know you, you know he, you know the the upright stuff you know uh, a la reggie workman and cecil mcbee and and scott lafaro and uh um you know he was doing that but the oh, upright but you filthy know, he dance, was the filthiest you know, upright he, player but you're telling me that <laughs> grover grover um jerry brown and Stanley is a trio. I mean, this is the most burning thing I've ever well, heard well, in my well, life. Well, 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 it wasn't. It was more than a trio. I mean, there were other musicians, other horn players, and and, and keyboardists, and uh, guitarists. Uh, even, even, there was even a, a couple times where, and God rest his soul, he just he just made a transition recently. Uh, the guitarist of uh, Reggie Lucas. I, he just played, passed. Uh, he just passed. You're absolutely yes, right. I was going to ask you yes. about him. Yes, yeah, he was in some of those bands as well. Would yes. you? So um, let me ask you though. Like, I mean, aside from having to play a deep bag of of pop tunes from across all genres, do you feel like you guys also were creating new musical vocabulary on the bandstand? Well, I, I, hmm. I guess you know. In retrospect, I, I guess we we did, you know, uh, start to started to develop some 
you know, some new concepts and, and, and you know, I guess maybe some early days of of linear linear playing, uh, you know, with with Stanley, what he was doing on, on the bass. Uh, what I was trying to do was, you know, was drums and playing, you know, playing along with Stanley and these, these concepts, and and that it had, you know, it had to groove, and uh, um, just the fact that you know, when you would see, when you could use these these concepts and still see people dancing, and that they were enjoying it. This is a very, you know, wow, we, we have some influence on the bands, like, you know, the bass and drums. And, you know, I, I've often said, you know, bass and drums, that's half the sound of any great band. And, you know, you know that's the foundation. So, Well, no, because it's really important. This is because we're talking to a titan here, Jerry Brown. And uh, because that's what Stanley was telling me. We've done two interviews. He's like, you know, it's kind of a best kept secret in the world is that the the rhythm sections are the ones that drive new musical vocabulary he was talking about it uh in the sense of people like tony williams and ron carter you could go to paul yep. paul motion and scotty lafaro um but like we let in with that absolutely positively thing and you're playing like i mean that's all you man and that 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 there was nothing there was nothing like that at that time going on so i mean when I, I, you're playing press roles you're i mean you're playing marching funk i mean i don't even know but the point is did it was there even out once you left for europe was there a time when you guys really felt like you were where a rhythm section was creating where you were part of a rhythm section that was creating new musical vocabulary uh i we both felt that and Although uh, after college we could well not even after college just the fact that while we were in college, Stan, you know Stanley kind of went his way in uh, 1971 72 that he he moved to New York and then he was like the new the new monster of uh, a base and, and you know just remembering articles that I was reading that you know the, you know the, there was this like. Uh, a rivalry, rivalry with uh, Stanley and uh, uh, the great bassist uh, Miroslav Vitus. Of course. Uh, so, you know, I was reading about that, and it's like, you know, my man Stanley's like, you yeah, know, that's my butt. <laughs> you know, we, we've known each other. It's like he's getting up there, and, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do my best, and you know, hearing Tony Williams, you know, with, you know, with uh, the life, you know, Tony Williams' lifetime. Uh, uh, there was one experience in, you know, in particular that uh, uh, I went to New York to this uh, uh, a club that was called Slugs. Sure. Uh, um, and it was there, although I wasn't able to get inside, but I heard the music from the outside. And that was like the, that first uh, 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 Tony Williams lifetime with the uh, uh, John McLaughlin and Larry Young was playing organ. Oh. And I heard that band, and what Tony was doing is like, you know, just kind of like, just what I was hearing was like jaw dropping. It's like, oh my God. So it's like, I'm hearing that. Uh, I met uh, uh, Alphonse Muzan. Oh, dude, the, the, uh, another the rest piece, in peace, you know, so monster, funky uh, snake foot right there, man. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I was I, I was kind of, you know, in the middle of, you know, maybe not as, as you know, well-known as, totally not as well-known, but I was there and I heard that. And, and, then, uh, and then when Stanley got together uh, uh, playing with Lenny White, so it's like these, you know, these monsters, <laughs> and then Billy Cobham with the with the with the band. So it's like, man, there was so much uh, inspiration and information. You know, you're darn was, right about Jerry. Yeah. You, I mean, and it was right in your face, and it was visceral, and everybody was accessible. 
And it, yep. uh, who, who, what were some of the, I mean, cause I mean, like there are live recordings that were pressed on vinyl of Youssef Latif playing at Pep's. I mean, you might, who, right. who were you playing with at Pep's? Was it Jimmy Heath? I mean, who, who were some of the cats? I mean, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say is like Lenny White's dad. They'd wait. They Lenny would take him to the uh, Lenny's dad would take him to the club. Jack and McLean would yell at him all night. I don't want backbeat. Don't give me any backbeat. You know. And then Lenny's dad would take him <laughs> take him home, and they'd get up at seven in the morning, and Lenny would go to school, and Dad would go to work. But you know, the point is, he was thirteen playing with Jackie McLean, and I'm like, okay, Jerry Brown, that's great. You're reading the articles about Vituous and and Stanley. But who were you? Who were some of the iconic cats that you had a chance to to, to, to play with? You were, you were definitely. Well, I mean, uh, the uh, I, I would say like after um, I went to I went to Europe in 1972, and I was I had the experience of playing with quite a few musicians in in Europe. But when I came back, the first guy that I played with uh, and. Uh, in 74 was a gentleman who I met in Europe that was the uh, violinist Michael Urbaniak. Wow. See, you have, and... that's what I'm saying. You're way out, man. You're such an... Because you played with... Uh, 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 what's his name? Zignu Ziefert. Well, I can't pronounce his name ever. Spignu Ziefert. Ziefert, yeah. Yes, no, uh, I mean, another mere uh, yes, uh, yes, another violinist. And, uh, uh, but, it, but in the Michael Urbaniak band was uh, the bassist was a guy who I met that I was introduced to back in uh, uh, in, in Philadelphia, and he was the cousin of uh, Reggie Lucas, and this person was the great bassist Anthony Jackson. Jeez. So he was in the band. So another absolute monster. So. Uh, that's right. You were, wait, wait, hold on. You were on those. You were on those uh, Funk Factory album, weren't you, with the Urbaniak? Yeah, that's right. Oh that's my right. God, right. man! Now it's all coming yep. back, dude. Because I know that Jackson was playing, but Gad was on a few tracks. You were on a few tracks. Yep. Let me yep. ask you a question, though. I, I this is interesting with Stanley and Grover, being that you, <clears throat> we have another track queued up. Maybe we may may or may not get to it in set one here, but I mean, you were obsessed with this third stream of rock and blues jazz and classical music i mean were you was that something that you guys were how how did you get into this classical vein and how did you integrate it into the the blues and the funk and the jazz well first of all uh, ironic that when i was you know first started playing drums okay well okay before that, <laughs> okay, the, the, okay. The, not many people know this. I know that's why you're on the but, Jake uh, Feinberg show but, now. But, yeah. but, but 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 anyway, uh, my parents they loved to dance, and although you know, they lived in Philadelphia, they often went uh, went to New York to the Savoy Ballroom. Uh, long story. When my when my mother was pregnant with me, she was dancing in the Savoy with my dad. So I was hearing like the Lucky Millinders and whoever else was playing uh, at the Savoy at that time. So I was hearing that from the inside. So now here I am born. Blah blah blah. blah. I started playing drums and I was about five years old. But when I started playing, it was rudimental drumming. And my teacher at that time was a well, originally uh, this his his name was Jake Hoffman, but he was all he was a you know a classically trained drummer. However, he was on the road so much, so he turned me over to his daughter uh, Elaine Hoffman Watts. So she started me on the whole classical thing. And uh, so I'm learning, you know, the rudimental drumming and, and two mallet and four mallet, uh, you know, and xylophone and uh, listening to the, uh, you know, Philadelphia Orchestra. Stanley was doing the same thing, but from the class, you know, from, from the cello and, and bass side. Exactly. So we, had, so we had this foundation 
of the classical music. And uh, I, I believe... Uh, I believe that, you know, if you've gone through this training of classical, being a classical whatever, you really, for whatever instrument, you really get to know your instrument and, you know, technique. And it's, it's, it, I, I believe that if you stay with it, it's easy, it's easy to, to develop all this technique and it really shouldn't be anything that you can't play. So I believe that with that, Foundation, Stanley and I, and and I'm sure, and many others, kind of figured out. It's like, well, you know, you can take a lot of these things from you know classical, and you can apply it apply it to to jazz. You know, just having that classical foundation, and it lent itself to, to, to anything and everything. Um, Jerry, I, I'm curious about, I, I guess. Because I know you went to to Europe, but I mean, you had to make a name for yourself in the states. Who were you? Who were you playing with here before you left for for Europe? Not really. <laughs> I was just, I was just you know in in college and and uh, you know playing some local gigs in in Philadelphia. Uh, there was there was <laughs> there was a trio that I played with. That there was a, uh, it was with uh, Stanley Clark, and a gentleman who we knew and turned out to be Stanley's brother-in-law. And his name was Charles Fambro, and Charles played in. Uh, he he played in uh, one of the one of the Art Blakey bands, like in. He was in the Art Blakey band when when uh, 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 Winton was in the band. Wow, he must have been. So wait, I mean, hold on. Where are the tapes of this, by the way? I, I mean, I need to hear tapes of this immediately. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, this is the most insane. I, I don't have I don't have any tapes, but but, but it just you know, and, and what was what was funny was, was that Stanley and Charles Fambro, their favorite pianist. Uh, was McCoy Tyler. Mm. So we would we would play like these trio gigs, and they would trade off first set and second set. Stanley would play uh, uh, piano, and Charles would play bass. And oh, boy. Set, oh, Charles, boy. Charles oh, piano. boy. Oh, <laughs> boy. Holy, I mean, so, and this was a local, did you get a chance to, was this all Philly, or did you go up to New York and play? In this no, no, just all in Philly. Oh, this is insane. But, but, but uh, you know, this training ground and, and, you know, working with these two great, you know, musicians and bass players. So, uh, you know, I would say uh, uh, so much of my success is due to the great bass players that I played with growing up. Now, I, okay, Stanley, mm-hmm. Charles Fambro. There's another bassist from Philly that you probably know of who I played with in those early days, and that is uh, Alfonso Johnson. Wow, Al, did you? And yeah. the other the other cat I, the other cat I was going to ask you about is Tyrone Brown. Oh yes, oh, yeah. the most fa- dude. Him, I can listen to all I do. All I do is listen to him and all I do is listen to him and Sherman Ferguson all day long. That's all I do, man. Yeah, now yeah, God bless. Sherman Ferguson. Oh. I met Sherman when I was about fourteen, and you know he kind of straightened me out because I, I thought I was like a young hot shot. <laughs> and, you know, he kind of he kind of straightened me out, and so uh, you know another uh, another great drummer who uh, who was from Philadelphia, but Tyrone. Brown, yeah, he played on some of those kids where when Stanley wasn't wasn't. Uh, with uh, uh, on these uh, R and B dances uh, with with Washington Tom Brown was there, so I had the luxury. I had this uh, an unbelievable luxury of playing, you know, with all these great bass players. Also, also, I mean, Anthony Jackson. I mean, before the Baniac, we played we played together because he would come to visit his cousin Reggie Lucas. What what did they what did those cats how what did what did they help you with 
the most? I mean, as a, what did you learn most from Anthony and Tyrone and uh, and and Stanley and those guys as as a, as a rhythm accompanist? Just finding that niche of where within that whatever style of music that you're playing together or, or uh, playing together with the basses and realizing that it's all a conversation. You're having this conversation with the, the basses. You're having a conversation with the other musicians, but mainly with this conversation with the basses. And that's the foundation of the music. You can do a little fill here, there, or something rhythmic, rhythmically, but then ultimately come back to where that groove is to be and, ha- and allowing that space. Oh, I love that's this. the magic. This is insane. That's, that's the magic. What did Sherman tell you? Specifically, like aside from just saying you're not that hot, kid. I mean, what, what was there? Was yeah, there... yeah, yeah. But but that was an awesome man. You know, you kind of playing a little much there. <laughs> you're playing a little much there, Gerald. Do you think? Do, yeah. Just I mean, stepping back from it. I mean, everyone's got to sing for their supper. But has there been a break in the lineage of of the music just because you had elder statesmen? Telling you straight up, hey, you're playing too, too you're, you're talking too much, you know, just settle down. Then you could actually go see these cats six nights a week. They were all accessible. There was huge touring circuits. And I just look at it now, and, and I used to think it was a supply and demand issue. You know, too many musicians, not enough clubs. And then there's also a patronage issue. But has there been mm-hmm. a breakdown in the lineage of, of, of melodic improvisation? I hate the word jazz. But I just want you to do people go back far enough as it relates to the lineage of this music? Hmm, that's a great question. I uh, take that really great question. Yeah, well, I mean, we can, you know, we got part, we got to do part two pretty soon. You know? <laughs> we got more, man. I, I don't know if there's. And I'm relating. I'm relating it more to younger. I'm relating it more to maybe p- p- possible students you have or younger cats, not not your generation. I would say that you know, I, I don't know if it's breakdown, but there's been a there's been a crack somehow where there's been a bit of a separation where um, when I was grow- when I was growing up, there were all these. As you said, there were all these great drummers. There was all this great music that 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 was coming out. And, you know, it was there was a time where you know, be it jazz or or R and B, these artists were putting out two re- two records a year. Exactly. There was no internet; hadn't even been thought of. There was radio. You knew of, of you know the jazz stations that you could listen to, uh, the R and B stations that you could listen to, the blues stations that you could listen to. And again, as you said, you know there was like a touring circuit, and people were coming through all all the time. So you. You could see these people was you know it, it wasn't it wasn't as difficult as it is now in, in the fact that you know there are not clubs that patronize to to the musicians to that music the, the, you know uh, you have to listen to serious radio to hear some you know some some jazz stations or you know, specialized radio, you know, the Pandoras and Spotify. So that's changed. The club that used to be no longer exists. Uh, the, well, no, the, let me, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to push back on this because I mean, wh- what I'm seeing is again, I was born in 1978. Okay. But Art Blakey used to say, my job is to wash away the dust of everyday life 
for those cats who are coming in after a long day. It was blue collar music, and it's turned into it sort was of this blue collar. It yes. was this upper. It's it's turned into this like. I mean, if you have a few hundred bucks, that I mean, it, listen. The only way I'm going to see live music today is if I get comp tickets. Like I'm not going to go to the Iridium or to, to to go to these these hoity toity things. Jazz has become this. Some some would say that around the time of this John Lee Jerry Brown explosion, the, when quote unquote, even though the first fusion music was Chano Pozo and Dizzy Gillespie, they just said jazz became an inside joke for jazz musicians. But I just look at it and I say there's just mm. something, there's just something something wrong here when you are when you are pred- when you are basically placating to a drink order a dinner order and the check hour and a half set goodbye bring in the next people i mean it's become a chop shop it's become very corporatized and to me you sap all the spiritual potential spontaneity and spirituality out of the music i'm sure there's a lot of clubs in europe like that but in this country we're on a formula trip and that's why when you can't detect authenticity in music then you that that it just spreads all the way through society. You want to know where fake news came from? It's because people can't they can't figure they can't detect it because we've been living with digital music for so. I'm throwing a lot at you. All I'm saying is that jazz was a groove music intended for people, not rich people. People, just people, just people. Yes, yeah, correct, correct. And uh, unfortunately. Uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, even more so now. Uh, um, there's n- there's a uh, little to grasp onto of hearing great music or seeing great music or that it's. You know, that that it's branded and what it truly is 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 a cultural. This 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 is something uh, of, of a cultural based feeling uh, um, with America. It's like it's one of the greatest gifts that America has, has given to the world of of these genres of music, and it's to be celebrated. It's very very celebrated in Europe. And it's it's um, you know governments they subsidize the music they subsidize the club so you there are so many musicians from America who are going to Europe have been always going to Europe but now more so than ever where they have difficulty living living in America. And, Performing the music in which, in which they love so much, with, you know, with jazz, and they, you know, musicians are seeing it's like I, you know, I need to go to Europe for two or three months in in a year, and that will allow me to actually raise a family from the from what I from what they would earn in Europe. That kind of makes makes it possible for the, for them to raise family. It's it's so much harder now as an upcoming musician to raise a family. At one time, you know, back in the day, you could do that. That was much easier to do, and I did it. Uh, you know, I have a you know I have a son who's uh, forty one years old, and you know, grandkids and stuff. He was raised. Now, I, I, it's much more uh, difficult, and uh, with all the uh, the stress of what's going on, particularly uh, here in America, boy, to to be able to raise a family and be a uh, musician. Forget it. Yeah. No. It's so, it, yeah. Well, I mean, so. just an artist in general. You know, I know. You, I know you. I, 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 we got to do part two as soon as possible, but I. I know you got to get to the airport, but I wanted to um, just ask you about the first time that you actually, Larry Willis uh, talked to me that, you know, 
Um, when you when you stifle the culture, um, which we're really good at now, we gentrify these neighborhoods like Harlem. But when you stifle the culture, that's how another Hitler comes to power. And um, and I just wanted you to talk about uh, your first time going to Harlem. I remember talking to Pat Martino. I think my first interview. I've done thir- about three thousand radio interviews, and Pat told me that mm-hmm. he left Philadelphia to go to Harlem. And the people that took him in were Billy James and Don Patterson and Red Holloway. And those, Mm -hmm. I mean, the point is that it was a bastion of not just, it wasn't just all black commerce. It was also, the culture was out in the street. Sugar Ray Robinson had had a jazz club there. You had all clubs there. And the culture was, and and can you talk about the first time that that you went to Harlem and experienced that? Well, because you, just well, it wasn't so much Harlem, but it was really even up us up to New York, and you, you know, of you knew growing up in Philadelphia, it's like okay, Philadelphia has some things, but it's you got to go up to New York, right? And it was just a, it was just a magic, it was just a magic time of you know all this music, all the musicians who you could you, who you could run into, you know readily available heroes who were walking <laughs> on the streets or, you know, playing in clubs that you could get into. You could, you could see them. You could, you could hear this, you know, this, uh, this great language of, uh, uh, inspiration and culture. And you could, you could sit in it and, would resonate with it, and then you leave, and you just had one of those you know, the numerous epiphanies of what you just heard, how <laughs> how, how that can relate. Right, to your it's called introspection. It's and called that, introspection, and and, yeah. and, and and that there were less distractions that allowed you to put in the work. To make to to practice that you had the desire and the motivation to do this because you're looking at this. I want to. Oh, I would love to play like that. Yeah, I did one. I don't know if you ever heard this story, uh, uh, but um, my dad, you know, he, he uh, was not a musician, but he just loved jazz and blues, and um, he bought this album from a. Uh, uh, um, uh, Art Blake in the Jazz Messengers, and I'm listening to the Blues March. Right. And I'm listening to him, to him playing in these press rolls that he did, and I was probably about nine years old or something like that. I'm taking lessons, and I'm listening to that, and I started crying, and my dad says, well, why are you crying? I says, Dad, I'm, I'll never be able to play a role like that. You just keep practicing. You just keep practicing. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. I want to. But I, this is important. You, the introspection, was insane. That's what this music is all about. If I was alive at that time, it would be about walking out of that club and being completely introspective, saying, "Man, I wanted to play like that," or "Wow, that was very emotional," or it would make me think about a relationship. Today. We have just gotten so accustomed, and I, I know it has to do with the academy, the fact that people are coming out of the academy. We've just been taught to stare and appreciate somebody's facility. Some cats would call that wanking it. I mean, that just drives me insane. To me, this should be yeah. the most spiritual thing in the world, and I thank God that you guys are still around to be able to express this on programs like myself because it's spiritual. Well, it is spiritual, and... As as my father would say in response to what you what you said, part of uh, your divine contract of, is not only that you've studied and you put in the work, but you have to pass this on. Exactly, he's nailed it, man. <laughs> you got to pass this on. That's it. That's that's your divine contract concerning music you've done this you've made all these experiences now you got to pass this on 
So, yeah, we yeah we we, yeah, we have to do a part two. And hey, part no, no. Two. What I was going to propose to you also, I don't know what your touring schedule is like, but because uh, we're going to do part two like next week if you're around. But um, I'm going to be out in Los Angeles June uh, 17th, 18th, 19th, and I would. If you're going to be around, I would love to get together and do a Facebook Live interview with you. I will be around. All right. Well, let's just do let's do part two on the radio because I we haven't even touched this uh, this ridiculous. A lot of stuff to talk, a lot of stuff to talk about, man. Hey, man. Much love to you, Jerry, and uh, much love to you. And you know, it's all about the groove because groove don't lie. Well, and 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 it's all about the heart too, man. So. Anyway, all about the heart too. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Jake. Be Thank good, you Jerry. so much. Later, man. Right. Bye bye. Jerry Brown. We got part two and part three, and how many more? I don't know. This is the Jake Feinberg show, and we will be back uh, tomorrow on Facebook Live with uh, a, a two-handed, four four-hand piano, uh, Steigerwalt. Until then, peace. Thank you.